Welcome back, everyone, to the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo and Joe Resinello. And once more, dear brothers and sisters, let us go into the breach. And we are very pleased and honored to be joined today by Brandon McGinley. Those of you who know the show know that uh, Brandon is a friend of the show. And we're also honored to be joined by his professor uh, and very well-known Princeton professor, Robert George. And for those of you uh, who don't know either one of them, we're going to give you just a quick bio. Brandon McGinley uh, is a Catholic writer and speaker based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He worked in politics for several years, including pro-life and pro-family advocacy with the Pennsylvania Family Institute. Most recently, he was the editor for EWTM Publishing. And McGinley's work has appeared in the Washington Post, First Things, The Catholic Herald, Plow, and The Lamp, among, among other venues. He speaks around the country on topics ranging from Catholic family life to friendship to church renewal. He is a 2010 graduate of Princeton University, where he met his wife, Katie. They have four young children. Also, Professor Robert George, who is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. And he was also one of Brandon's professors while Brandon attended that school. Brandon McGinley, Professor Robert George, welcome to the front line with Joe and Joe. Thank you. Thanks for having, thanks for having us. Awesome. So our custom is to begin with the prayer. Today is the feast of uh, St. Uh, John of the Cross. He is a doctor of the church known as the mystical doctor. So I'm sure he'll be watching over all of us and this conversation. So we'll begin as we begin all good things in the name of the Father, Amen. Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who sought your help or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto you, a virgin of virgins, our mother. To you we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in your clemency hear and answer us. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Brandon, I think a good place to start is the title of the book. I think sure. it's interesting, The Prodigal Church. Can you tell us where you came up with it and why? Sure. Yeah. You know, it was um, like a European soccer team. It was uh, constantly promoted through the ranks. I, uh, I used the phrase in the second or third chapter. And then um, decided I liked it enough to, uh, you know, call a sub subsection of the chapter by that title. Then I called the chapter by that title. And then when we were talking about titles for the book, I suggested it, and that's what we went with. You know, uh, the uh, the idea. Uh, you know, when people think about the, the idea of the prodigal son, you know, for me, the idea isn't to focus on that idea of prodigality, which is a quite a negative word that has to do with wastefulness and. Um, and a, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, an unappealing and, and wasteful luxury and so on. Um, but the entirety of, the, uh, of, of the, the parable, which includes, and for me, when I think of the prodigal son, I think of the restoration and reconciliation at the end. So it's not about the pigsty as much as it is about the return. And so that for me is the idea of the, of the, the title is to remind us that just as the prodigal son who uh, you know, went off and lived this life of dissipation, this life of uh, dissipation is one of my favorite words in that, in that entire uh, parable. Um, the thing that is dissipated, like the sandcastle that is washed away by the tide, loses its integrity. It loses what it means to be itself. And they also cannot be restored by natural means. Something that's broken can be put back together, but something that's dissipated has lost the, the principle of its wholeness, uh, the principle of what it is. And yet, and yet, the beautiful thing is that through grace, through the Holy Spirit, the, the prodigal son can be restored. And uh, in our day and age, the dissipation that we as Catholics have, I think, too often experienced in our own lives and in our institutions can be healed but it requires us to remember that we rely on the grace of the sacraments, that we rely on the grace that is mediated to us um, by the church. And so, uh, so for me, the title uh, is meant to evoke um, both that sense of crisis, but also importantly, essentially, um, a, 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 an optimism, a hope, a, uh, a, a joyful hope um, for what is possible in our day. You know, I, I think, you know, just to give you, a, you know, a little perspective on my, I'm 50, you know, and I've seen, I, I grew up Catholic my whole life, you know, growing up in New Jersey, uh, you know, of Italian descent, same with Joe, went to Catholic school. I mean, 
the catechism is not sadly taught in a way that it probably should. And I say that because I didn't know a lot of things. I went to Catholic, you know, high school. I went to Jesuit college. I didn't know how to pray the rosary. I never knew what adoration was. Um, I learned these things on my own. And I think, you know, the, the hierarchy of the church in a sense, and if I'm wrong, and I think Professor George, you would have, I think a deeper insight into that. Um, just because to be honest with you, you were probably catechized during the Baltimore catechism days. Um, I wish I was, uh, you know, <laughs> sadly I, I was not. Um, it seems like it's, the teaching was diluted um, to basically please the contemporary culture. I don't think it was successful. I don't think that 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 approach has been successful. And in a sense, our church has lost its moral authority. I'd be interested in both your perspectives on that. Go ahead. Well, uh, first, let me just say how delighted I am to be on and thank you for inviting me. And it's a special pleasure and really a joy uh, to be on with Brandon. I'm so proud of Brandon. I think back to uh, when he and Katie uh, were my students at, uh, at, at Princeton. Uh, and now I see their beautiful uh, family and I see the wonderful work that Brandon is doing for the church and the world uh, out there in the public square, the leadership he's given, uh, the deep thoughtfulness of his, uh, his published writings. And I can't help my chest from swelling with pride in, uh, in what I'm seeing from Brandon. And it's Brandon's generations, people like Brandon, who really are the future of the, of, of the church. Uh, Brandon talked about the importance of hope that's so central to his book. And of course, it's a theological virtue, faith, hope, and love. It's indispensable. What gives us ground for hope? Well, ultimately, of course, God. That's in whom we repose our, our hope. But when I look for hope, what gives me hope is I see Brandon and so many of his generation who are out there doing the same thing. I, I'll, I'll mention some other former students. Brandon will remember Ryan and uh, Sharif Girgis, Melissa Moskella, uh, uh, Joel Alessia, th these are even in my small circle of students and acquaintances, young Catholics who are exercising enormous leadership and buoying us up. Uh, I'm actually 15 years older than uh, you are, so uh, I can't quite remember the Baltimore uh, Catechism. That's not a slight. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm one of these guys who's proud of my, proud of attain my, attaining my years. I, I, uh, I'll, I'll hold up my Medicare, my newly acquired Medicare card and, <laughs> and smile at you if you uh, give me the opportunity. But um, uh, the formative experience for me growing up was the shift uh, at the Second Vatican Council and concretely the liturgy. So I barely remember the old liturgy. Uh, I uh, remember being an altar boy. Uh, an altar boy. Uh, I remember uh, learning the Latin responses that the altar boys said, uh, the confidier, uh, for example. Uh, I remember ad orientum uh, and the Latin. Uh, but that all changed when I was, what, eight, nine, ten yeah. years old. And uh, in uh, the the chaos really that, that ensued in the wake of the council, we see some of our contemporary problems. Now saying that, I wanna make clear, I think the council was a fantastic thing and a necessary thing. It was a reforming council and reforms were needed. It was a renewing council and renewal was needed. The documents of the second Vatican council are beautiful and wonderful and they articulate the Christian understanding of the church and the world. Yeah. Uh, we must not romanticize the pre-conciliar church. It appeared very strong and solid. Yes, all that's true. Uh, and it, it had some wonderful things. Uh, if we go back to the 50s, the 40s, the 30s, American Catholicism in particular, uh, there were some things worth praising and some things worth recovering, but it was not a golden age. And there was much that was wrong and the council tried to deal with that, of course, throughout the world, not only in America. And I think some of the uh, dimensions of the council, which received the most criticism from those who were regarded as the conservative forces, were among the best and most beautiful. 
the, the document Dignitatis Humanae, the Great Declaration on Religious Freedom, that was a wonderful contribution to our Christian understanding of the liberty of the person uh, to seek God uh, and to live with integrity uh, in light of one's best judgments as to the great existential questions of meaning and, and value. The document Nostra Aetate on the non-Christian religions and the, and the church's relationship to the non-Christian religions, beginning with the mother religion of our faith with Judaism, but also discussing Islam, the great Eastern traditions of Buddhism and Hinduism and so forth. Nostra Aetate is a great, necessary, important, profound contribution to Christian uh, understanding. The so-called spirit of Vatican II represented a hijacking. What I knew you were gonna get to that. <laughs> the spirit of Vatican II, that was the spirit that was in line with the letter. <laughs> what we got was a wayward spirit that was not in line uh, with, the, uh, with the letter. But uh, Brandon's generation has no recollection, personal recollection of those, of those battles. In a certain way, they uh, can, can fly above them. Uh, the, 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 the old wars uh, are, are in our ancient history. They just want the true and pure, authentic Catholic faith as it has developed. And remember, our faith is a faith in which our, the doctrines, the understandings of the church are enriched over time. We have a development of doctrine, as Cardinal John Henry Newman said. And so, so when people like Brandon do the work that Brandon's doing in the book that we're discussing, I think it's a great contribution to the church. It represents an appreciation of the developed teachings of the church and helps to apply those to the concrete challenges which are extremely difficult that we're facing today as Catholics and just as people in the modern world. Professor George, let me let me ask you this because you said something. Obviously, Brandon's book is called The Prodigal Church. Just keeping with the prodigal son for, for, for just a moment. I would say our generation, like I said, Joe and I'm 53, Joe's 50, okay? I think we were the, we were the prodigal son that was out there partying, okay? <laughs> And the generation in between Brandon and ours, okay, was were the ones that were, let's say for argument's sake, feeding the pigs, <laughs> right? And obviously Brandon's generation, as you say, you're very proud of because they seem to be not only on the journey home, okay, um, they seem to have arrived, okay? They've, they've, they've embraced the father and the sandals are, and the rings are on, on their hands. How much of that... Um, is a of Brandon's generation return to the church. How much of that is a function of the nihilistic culture that I liken to those pods that the prodigal son was feeding to the pigs? How much of that is a reaction to to to, to the let's call it what it is this swamp of a culture that that we have and people saying like Brandon, this isn't what I want. This isn't anything that I find either good, true, or beautiful. I'm going back home. Well, it's a great and important question. Uh, I can't quantify it. When you say how much, I can't say what the quantity is. Uh, but let me say two things. Number one, that corrupt culture not only seeped into the church as an institution, the so-called institutional church, not only seeped in, it flooded in. Yeah. The church itself has been corrupted by so many of these wayward cultural uh, uh, trends. We see it in the sex scandals, which, which, which didn't begin yesterday, by the way. <laughs> There's a history of that as well. Uh, we see it in so much else that is uh, wrong in the church. But the second thing, and here's the hopeful note, the second thing is I am just bowled over by the astonishing intellectual, moral, and spiritual quality of the men and women, including young men and men, men and women who join the church mm. as teenagers or as adults. I mean, I see it at Princeton with some of these kids, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years old, or graduate students, 23, 24, 25 years old, or faculty members. Mm -hmm. This is not a pretty moment for the church. The church is not beautiful at the moment. Our liturgy is not beautiful. The scandals are obviously hideous. You would think this would be the weakest moment for the church, and yet we see these magnificent, brilliant, serious, morally serious people 
seeing the beauty of the church, despite all the mud spattered on her, despite the degradation and they're coming in. Um, the wonderful philosopher R.J. Snell and I um, published a book just a couple of years ago uh, on contemporary adult converts to the faith who come from the intellectual world, from the little part of the universe that we inhabit, our fellow scholars and, uh, and teachers, amazing people, absolutely amazing people. And again, this gives me great hope. Yeah. Friend, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, um, it's something that I, I think about a lot that as the contradictions of the world around us become only more and more apparent, um, on the one hand, there are going to be people who kind of get used to the darkness, who um, who and find the light of Christ, the light of the church, to be all the more frightening because they become so accustomed to how um, become accustomed to the corruption of the world, and yet at the same time, for precisely the same reason that the contrast is being heightened and that the darkness seems like it's getting darker in the world around us, um, that light will be all the more appealing for those with eyes to see it. And ultimately, of course, we all have eyes to see it, but um, you know, we, uh, we, we, uh, so I think that there is, um, there's good reason to believe that so long as the church is being uh, is, is, is being authentic to her own reality, to the reality that she is and represents, um, there's a great reason to believe that we will see um, more and more people like uh, Professor George was describing being drawn to her and not just in the academic world, but out in, out in, you know, out in my neighborhood in Pittsburgh and out here in, uh, out here in the, in the, in the kind of the, the, the regular world. Um, you know, I, I think one of the, one of the main points I wanted to make in the book was that um, the, the church is at her very best when she is, because she is by her very nature, a culture building institution. And so uh, the idea of cultural Catholicism gets a bad name, but that's, that's Catholic culture with the, with the spirit, with the, the, with the, the, um, with the, uh, the kind of the spirituality or the, uh, or the kind of the vertical axis between us and heaven removed and with the culture just remaining. But at her very best liturgy, the liturgy of the church, the, the prayers of the church, the sacraments of the church, the grace that she mediates to the world, these have um, material, corporal, embodied impacts in the world around us, and they create a culture, a culture of art, a culture of community, a culture of, uh, a culture of, 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 of politics, a culture that is distinctive, um, but it is also profoundly uniting and human. Um, and so, when I think of one of the big tasks that we have before us today, certainly for our, for my generation, is to say, okay, we uh, we have a, a very dark world around us. We have a church that has kind of lost the thread when it comes to um, building and maintaining a culture that is uh, that does not allow itself to be co-opted, that is uh, stronger than, and in fact, it attempts to co-opt the world around us. Um, how do we uh, pick up the pieces of that? dissipation um, and, uh, and try to rebuild a genuinely Catholic world, a genuinely Catholic culture. And then, you know, again, for me in the book, that is about A, making concrete decisions about how we order our lives by, uh, especially, you know, among family and friends to form the kind of communities that have a, a staying power that can be sustainable. And B, uh, doing that completely uh, with a complete and authentic understanding that we are relying on God and his grace to make it possible. Um, and that, and that goes to the, back to the title of the book that uh, we are restored by God's grace. We're restored by coming home to him and allowing him, allowing him to restore us. Uh, and not just as individuals, but as families, as friends, as communities, and ultimately as a civilization. You say this in the book, and I, and I love this because I completely agree with it. And then I want to comment on it, and I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. You say, we must operate without political fear as witnesses to the truth of the Catholic faith with a boldness that emerges from holiness, which is the product of grace acting on our souls and in our communities. The reason why I love this is... Re you cannot like reform what is perfect. The church in mm -hmm. its essence is truth because Christ is truth, but you can renew. But that renewal is comes in the form of grace. Mm -hmm. 
I've, you know, I've had my issues, you know, like, like, you know, with the church, with regard to some of the, the, the things that I have seen and I have tried, you know, I tried to teach RCIA. I actually was asked to leave RCIA. I was teaching it as the book was, you know, told, they said, you can't teach it that way. I ran into trouble, but you know, I've read into this and I've come to the conclusion, basically what you just said, Brandon, that's what St. Catherine of Siena did. That's what Francis did. It's holiness that will reform the church. And I read something on Catherine of Siena because she was a great reformer. And she basically said, if you try to reform the church like you would a corporation, you'll end up leaving it. <laughs> you have to reform yourself and it's God's grace. And I say this on our show all the time, only saints change the world. And we have the capacity to do that. Every one of us. And it's that holiness that will change the church. I'd love to hear your comments and also Professor George. Yeah, re reform is a product of holiness. It doesn't go the other way around. Um, and that's something that, or I guess I suppose it can, but the, the first movement is God's. And in, in the first movement is God's in our souls to prepare us to take on the responsibilities that he has, that he has laid out for us. And so um, I think it is very easy the, the thing you said about Catherine and Siena and, and the way we think about the church and reforming the church is so important because um, I think that we are seeing right now a, a very um, worrying importation of, the, of, a, of habits of viewing the kind of corporate and political worlds into the way we think about the church, seeing church leaders as more like elected officials and presidents and legislators mm -hmm. rather than being a, a apostolic hierarchy. Um, and uh, and and seeing um, being opposed by those forces, or even seemingly being opposed by those forces, by by those uh, by those uh, by the hierarchy, as being uh, a mark of of, of holiness, uh, rather than um, expecting uh, expecting uh, those who seek reform to be holy beforehand. Um, and so, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I just think it's absolutely really, really essential because um, uh, otherwise what you're going to see is, um, is, is all of the trends that we, that we talk about that have been accelerated over the past year or four years or decade or whatever um, towards alienation and towards um, fracturing, towards polarization. We're seeing those in the church and the more we import secular views of the way politics is supposed to work into the church, uh, and erase, frankly, the idea of grace from the picture as if, as if it's a question of being a power struggle or, or just having the right rhetoric or having the, you know, the, 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 most, uh, the most lucrative um, you know, media apostolate or whatever, uh, is um, that is going to only uh, take the, 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 the biggest problems in the world around us and import them right into, uh, right into the church. And I think that's happening. Professor George, what are your thoughts? Well, let me make three uh, quick points. Uh, the first two, respectively, are about pushes and pulls. I, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, the darkness in the culture, the nihilism, as you rightly called it, uh, the emptiness of what's on offer, what, what the world proclaims as good and true and worthwhile, is a push. Uh, people can't be satisfied with what's on offer, wealth and power and influence and prestige and status and pleasure. Uh, those are ephemeral things. They're, they're not bad in themselves because all of those things can be used for good ends, but they're not good in themselves. They are means to other ends. And what's important are the things that are ends in themselves, faith, family, truth, honesty, dignity, respect, love. Uh, God himself, ultimate, ult ultimately. So I do think that the darkness, the unsatisfactoriness of what's on offer from the culture is a push of people toward the church. And then there are the poles. In my own uh, conversations with converts, and I go back to the converts, in my own conversations, especially in recent years, I've been amazed at how often it's Our Lady is attracting these brilliant, and, and of course I deal with intellectuals all the time, so I'm a little bit of a skewed sample here, these brilliant 
people, mostly young men and women, intellectually oriented men and women, they're drawn by a simple, uneducated girl from Nazareth, married at a very young age, as girls were betrothed at a very young age, uh, not some great intellectual, but the mother of our Lord, our pure and spotless mother. And she is such an attraction to people. And then more broadly, there's what uh, Pope John Paul II called the splendor of truth. Truth has a certain luminosity. So even when the church is splattered with mud, the truth that she proclaims, the truth that is Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, still shines through. It has a certain luminosity. And if you're looking, if you're searching, if you're a seeker, you'll be pulled. So there's the push of the degradation of the culture, and there's the pull of the truth, and there's the intercession of Our Lady so often pulling people, being attractive to people. Then the third point I want to make, and this also goes to a, um, a development since the Second Vatican Council and in part reflected in the Council. Um, I guess I'm the only one old enough to remember a time when Catholics, especially American Catholics, were a rather insular lot. We talked to our fellow Catholics. Uh, and, the, and that was good and bad. <laughs> right, right, yeah. But the, but the bad part of it is, you know, we, there, there was much to learn from our fellow uh, uh, citizens and, and, and people of different faiths and often our fellow believers that we weren't learning. And, and often we had misunderstandings of who and what they were and they had misunderstandings of who and what we were. It was a highly, highly unsatisfactory situation. One of the good things, so if we're looking on the good side of the ledger, yeah. is the engagement of Orthodox Catholics. Th these, are, these are Catholics who are with the church 100%, but because they're confident in their own faith and understand their own faith, they embrace in a bond of fellowship and they cooperate and work together as, as Brandon has with, uh, with the council that he has uh, led uh, in Pennsylvania on the family. Uh, we work together with our Protestant friends, our Jewish friends, our uh, uh, LDS, Mormon friends, even people from um, uh, traditions that weren't very well represented uh, when I was young, uh, the, the Muslim tradition or the Eastern uh, traditions. There are more and more such people in the United States. Uh, we recently lost the great rabbi, uh, former chief rabbi of, of, of the United Kingdom, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Well, he was one, he became in the last 15 years, one of my dearest friends in the world because we shared a spiritual bond that earlier generations of Jews and Catholics would never have known about. And this was a bond not between two people who didn't take the specifics of their faith seriously. This wasn't a lowest common denominator bond. This bond was only possible between someone who really believed his Jewish faith and really and someone who really believed his yeah. Catholic faith. And that makes all the difference. And I think that the work that we have to do in the world is work that involves our locking arms, embracing those with whom we may disagree on theological questions, on doctrinal questions. We can now have conversations that we couldn't have before about our differences, but we can also realize how much we have in common and we can work together to do what from a Catholic point of view, we would describe as, they can describe it in their own terms, we would describe it as the sanctification of the world. Sure. That I, is true. That's yeah. true ecumenicalism. And that's, uh, Joseph Ratzinger laid that out very well. He basically yeah. said, it's friendships that basically you could say, I believe this, you believe this, but you are my friend and you allow the Holy Spirit to work on the differences. You see, too many times we try to force that. We try to force God's hand. I am called to love you. We may not agree, and that's what's lost in the society. We could disagree on things, on things that are very, very, very divisive. And it's going to lead me to my next question, actually, because you, uh, Professor George, you wrote this book, believe it or not, I read this many, oh, many years is. ago, <laughs> um, and I loved it, actually. You lay out, basically, an argument for the traditional Judeo-Christian values. I recommend all people, by the way, to get this book. It's uh, Clash of Orthodoxies. I think it's very appropriate now, uh, Law, Religion, and Morality in Crisis. Basically, you argue that the traditional Judeo-Christian like values are by far superior to secular 
liberal alternatives. Now, what are some of those alternatives? We have abortion. We have, you know, the argument of traditional marriage. It's a big argument now. Same-sex marriages are on, you know, they're front and center. You talk about embryonic cell, stem cell research. You talk about religion in the public square. Euthanasia. All, all these things are basically at the forefront. And this is, this is what I, I want to talk a little bit about. I mean, these secular issues have obviously affected the culture and the church. Basically approaching, speaking truth to the culture and having them listen to it seems very difficult because to be honest with you, they just don't see the math. I think you're 100% correct. The math is so square, yet the culture is so resistant to that. I want to hear what both of you have, have to say, because like one, Professor George, you teach young people. So I'm sure not everyone was like Brandon, you know, <laughs> like, so you have all types of people. And then, they can't all be that good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, Brandon, you're, you're in, a, in a, di a different generation. As Joe said, I mean, a lot of my generation did the wrong thing. And then we kind of saw the error of our ways. Brandon's generation is in the Catholic Church is, to be honest with you, the John Paul II generation. So I want to hear both your perspectives on like what Professor George laid out in that book. Go for it. Well, if, you, if you'd like me to go first, I'm going to reserve most of the time for, uh, for Brandon. Uh, first, I want to say we're here to talk about Brandon's book. Oh, absolutely. I, I don't mean that, Brandon. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I think it's very appropriate. Like, I, I love, hold on. Uh, uh, I'm <laughs> church. Okay, <laughs> okay very important. Um, so I think of my, uh, think of my students as, um, as my children. And uh, so maybe Brandon's book is a sort of offspring of my book. So there, there's a parental relationship there, but I'd, I'd be very proud if that were true. <laughs> uh, but my, my argument, uh, the point I wanna make and did make in Clash of Orthodoxies and so many of my other writings is that we need to be prepared to take on the secular progressive or secular liberal perspective, which is so dominant in the elite sector of the culture on the merits of rational argument. The, the other side, the secular progressives want to say that this is a battle between faith and reason. And they've got the position of reason and ours relies entirely on faith. Could not be further from the truth. The problem with their point of view is that it fails the test of reason. The virtue of ours is that it passes that test with flying colors. Now, how do you prove that? Retail, not wholesale. In other words, making the argument in case after case after case and so if you wanna talk about abortion and embryo destructive research, we need to make the argument in works like the book that I wrote with Christopher Tollefson, Embryo, A Defense of Human Life. Uh, and you make the argument and show that the liberal position on that particular issue is simply rationally unsupportable. Shift to marriage. It's a tough issue today because so much power, cultural power is in the hands of people who support a revisionist understanding of marriage is essentially sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership. Marriage was never understood as anything like that in any culture that I know of prior to the contemporary period, but you have to take it on retail. So Sharif Girgis and Ryan Anderson, friends of, of Brandon's, uh, and I wrote the book, What is Marriage, Man and Woman of Defense? And I wrote the book with Patrick Lee, Conjugal Union, What Marriage is and Why It Matters. And we send it out there. We're not asking anybody to believe anything on faith. We ourselves have faith. We think there are good grounds for having faith, but we will take on secular progressive ideology on the plane on which it says, or its proponents say they wanna have the fight. That is the plane of reason. Who's got the more reasonable position? Whose position can be shown to be unreasonable? That's a battle I am happy to take on any day of the week. Uh, Professor George, but I, this may sound a little critical, okay, of, of others, okay? But doesn't that require people to put down their damn cell phones, get their face <laughs> out of Netflix and YouTube, okay? And even though we want people to watch this interview on YouTube, doesn't it require to, uh, uh, on the part of the individual to educate oneself on these different, let's say, um, let's say philosophical worldviews, let's say you mentioned, uh, or, or, or let's say you could talk about this neo-Gnosticism um, yep. that we kind of live in now, nihilism. People need to be, my larger point is, people need to be familiar with those terms. People need to start reading more. Um, people need to put down their cell phones. People need to stop looking at this 
this superficial culture that we live in and actually take the time to say, well, look, I know something's wrong, but let me let me start reading and find out what's wrong so that I can make that argument that Professor George is saying that would be very a good idea to make. I know, again, that sounds critical, but I haven't been an avid reader my whole life, but in the last 10 years I have been. In other words, and, and, and the idea is we need to equip ourselves. We were talking earlier about equipping ourselves with the grace of God. We also need to use our intelligence and our reason to, to understand these concepts so that we can argue them more effectively. Oh, you're exactly right, uh, Joe. Um, but I think the other side of that is we need to be willing to use the media and mechanisms that are available to us to reach people today. So I don't disdain social media. I'm active on social media, as Brandon is as well. It, we're not going to be able to get rid of social media. It's here. It's here to stay. We need to master it. We need to work with it. We need to do battle on that plane uh, as, as well. Uh, let's make social media work for the causes that we believe in, the cause of truth as we understand uh, the truth. Second thing I'd say, Joe, is um, not everybody needs to be able to make the argument at the level of philosophical depth at, at which I try to make it. I think there, it, it's important for the church and for the broader community of people across the lines of theological division who want to stand up for these traditional values. It's very important for people to uh, respect their place in the division of labor. There's some people who are going to do the deep philosophical and theological work. There are some people who are going to transmit that because they're very good at translating complicated philosophical and theological notions into language that people can understand. There are going to be other people who can take it down even a notch further to communicate it to young people, uh, even as far down as, as elementary school, even kindergarten. You know, today, you've got the progressive left, including on sexual issues, childhood innocence is gone. Even on sexual issues, the progressive left is trying to get their views into kindergartens and first and second grades are trying to indoctrinate children. They're, that, that, they're, they're gonna play there. We have no choice but to play there. Yeah. So we need people who can articulate the basic understanding in an age appropriate way, yeah. you know, without scandal, without compromising uh, childhood uh, innocence, any worse than it has been compromised by the folks on the other side. Uh, so we need that as well. One thing I think it's important to say, and I'll conclude just with this, um, sometimes what people need to see, Joe, is the ability of somebody successfully to make the argument. It's not necessary that they be able to make it themselves. Mm -hmm. They need to see that it can be made because so often the folks on the other side intimidate our people. They say nobody can make an argument in favor of, of, of conjugal marriage. Marriage is the union, conjugal union of husband and wife. Uh, if you believe that, you can only believe it on the basis of irrational faith. Well, even if an ordinary mom and dad can't communicate to their children who are facing all these cultural trends and uh, norms, can't communicate the argument the way I might make it or Brandon might make it to their children. They need the confidence to know that that argument can be made. Right. And they need to be able to point their children to places, maybe on YouTube, you know, <laughs> on social media, ideally in books, uh, where that argument is made successfully. Brandon, what's your experience with this clash of orthodoxies in your generation? You know, because I'm sure you have all types of friends, you know, you, you know, you're in the world, you and your wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, I think, um, you know, that the idea, um, the idea of, uh, first of all, the kind of trickling down of, of ideas. I mean, I graduated, I graduated from Princeton in 2010. There are things that there are things, especially with regard to gender ideology, that would have been fringe at Princeton a decade ago that are now mainstream in corporate culture. That's how quick things have moved, um, and so it, it it shows you know it, it can become overwhelming because how do we fight all these battles? We only have so many resources, but it's a, it's a great reminder of how um, of how uh, you know. The, the thing that has become much more obvious precisely for this reason, because we've seen the way that power has worked and the way that um, new orthodoxies, to use the language of Professor George, have become 
um, have just not just seeped, but have been infused into society. Um, it, you know, for, for my generation, that has made it all the clearer that we are dealing with a clash of orthodoxies and not a, um, a, uh, a, a, a banal neutrality um, against which you have uh, left and right wings that we should be wary of. The, 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 like, like the fish that's swimming in water, we're swimming in a secular liberal environment. And, the mo and once you see that, once you see that that, is, that, 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 um, that removing religion, specifically the church from the public square, is not a neutral um, position, not one that is neutral between religion and irreligion or between, you know, between left and right, but in fact enforcing one of the orthodoxies that are clashing. Uh, once you see that, you know, you can't unsee it. Um, and so for my generation, um, it's a lot easier to see because, and frankly, because we've lost so much ground, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's impossible to deny unless you have really um, kind of imbibed it to the point, uh, I suppose, where it becomes uh, impossible to see the world any other way. But I think, uh, um, I think that kind of like what we're saying at the very beginning of the conversation, the enhanced uh, contradictions in the world around us um, create a, a very... Uh, a, a, can create a situation that can induce a lot of anxiety for us as Catholics, that can induce a lot of fear, but it doesn't have to. It can induce in us a uh, hope and, um, and, uh, and, and, and steal our resolve to be bold uh, in politics and in our own lives and the concrete decisions we make and how we order our families and how we choose our professions and how we choose where we live and how we choose our friends and how we act with our friends and how we decide, um, how we decide to, to, uh, to, to have more uh, kind of uh, hospitable and, and intimate relationships with friends than the world success suggests is possible. You know. This goes to the other thing that Professor George said that I, I want to talk about briefly, which is that having the argument out there at a level, a high level of philosophical depth is important because it's something we can show this is possible. So much of the, um, when it comes again to that idea of uh, we're living kind of you know, swimming in a secular liberal, uh, swimming in water uh, that we don't, we don't always see it becomes impossible to realize that another way is possible. It's very hard to realize that another way is possible. Another way intellectually, in terms of what is philosophically possible, what is philosophically, not just justifiable, but philosophically correct, using the light of human reason alone. Uh, but it also becomes really hard to imagine what it's like to live in a way that's different from the world around us. And so uh, one of the big points I wanna make in the, in, in the book, in the, in the prodigal church is that it's up, one, one thing it's up to us as the laity is to demonstrate by the, by the conduct of our lives that another way is possible. Demonstrate by our families that another way is possible. Demonstrate by the communities we build that another way is possible. Um, and, and, and in that way, um, that, in a small way, but in a really important, because that's, you know, in another time we'd be talking about trying to implement things, but right now we just need to, to show that another, another way of living, another way of thinking, another way of being is possible. That's, that's the, 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 uh, the, the point at the, at the game we're in right now is, um, is, is pretty dire um, for a lot of people who haven't been exposed to anything like Professor George and I have been uh, academically and, and spiritually and, and institutionally. Um, and so just demonstrating another, that another life and another way of thinking is possible is the essential first step towards people choosing another way of life and another way of thinking, and another that's way a, of being in the world. And it strikes me, Brandon, that that's that small flame you were talking about in immense darkness shines ever brighter, darker it comes, even that small flame <clears throat> yeah. is recognizable. You could see it. You know, it, it's funny. Uh, when you were talking about that, I was thinking of Malcolm Muggridge, actually. Mm -hmm. He was a brilliant man. I'm sure he heard all the arguments. You know, he was a worldly man, but it was not until he encountered Mother Teresa. Now she wasn't an intellectual. He was clearly superior to her in terms of pure, you know, brain power. However, it was what she did that blew him away. And that's who God used to bring Mother Teresa to the world. He was basically like an atheist. 
Mm -hmm. And that's the mystery. And that's what I think you're talking about. People have to see it. And this is why I love your book, Brandon, because it's optimistic. There's an optimism there. And you're basically saying that in this darkness, there is an answer. I want to talk about that optimism. And I also want to hear what Professor George has to say, because I follow him on social media. And basically, he always offers solutions. Yeah. I like that because there are a lot of people who are very popular, you know, in the Catholic circles. I'm not going to get into it. I'm not going to name call, but they're, they're negative. And frankly, it weighs on you after a while. Like, you're just like, gosh, you know what I mean? I get it. The paint's falling off the wall, but for crying out loud, can we talk about something good, a solution? Yeah. So first, Brandon, why so optimistic in the book? And then Professor George, I want to talk about your solutions that you always offer on social media. I, you know, I, I, I just, I think that, I think that hope, hope is important all the time. Hope is a theological virtue, but I think hope's especially important now because the allure of despair is strong. Um, despair uh, gives despair can be can feel liberating because it you can feel like oh nothing good's going to come so I I don't have to worry about it or I don't or I don't have to follow the uh, I don't have to be great because. Because, because greatness isn't possible anymore. Uh, I don't have to be holy. I don't have to be prayerful. I don't have to be godly because that because that's not effective. Because it's not because that's not uh, because we need to we need to break the rules. We need to we need to break a few uh, break a few eggs to make an omelet. Uh, I suppose you know ecclesially or, or politically. I think there's a great deal of despair, um, often profitable despair, um, because it. It, um, in a very negative way, it uh, it appeals to people who are looking for a way to understand the world, um, but it digs into and appeals to a, a, a dark side of, uh, of of human nature, which is one um, that just wants to be told how bad things are uh, and wants to feel superior, but doesn't want to actually do the hard work of of of, uh, of making things better um, and making things better begins, this is why I, you know, I, uh, the focus on grace in the book comes from having worked with Dr. Scott Hahn out here in the Steubenville area, um, like 45 minutes away. And you know, he has such an emphasis on grace and I never really understood grace. And I, you know, we never really fully understand grace in this world, I suppose. But I, I came to see that just how, in a, the smallest possible way, I suppose, I came to see just a, a little bit of how important it is. I see it in my own family. I see it in my own, in my own friendships. I see how things that are not supposed to be possible in, uh, in this world of alienation and in this world of distrust and quid pro quo, uh, I've come to see how generosity and charity are really possible. And it's clear that it's possible because of God. This is what grace does for us. So much of the negativity in the church and in Catholic engagement with politics and in Catholic engagement with the, with the church, you know, with the pol internal politics of the church, I think is frankly graceless. It, it is, it, 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 it believes that the only way to get things done is, is, by, is by power plays. Now power is important, power is an aspect of human, human politics, human, you know, human life, but through, uh, but, but, see, but it sees uh, that, it's that, 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 that says that we have to, um, that we can't be too holy, that we can't follow the rules, that we can't, we can't, um, uh, that we can't be too good because if we're too good, we'll be taken advantage of. You know, it's the, um, you know, we have to be wise as serpents. We do. Christ said so. But he also said we have to be innocent as doves. We focus on that first aspect of Christ's admonition. And then we forget about the second because there's that push and pull we talked to Professor George talked about earlier. Yes, we have to identify uh, the problems in the world to kind of accentuate the push away, but to, for the pull to work in the, in, in the sense of our appeal, our witness that makes the intercession of lady look like something that's a real thing in this world and not just, not just pious nonsense, we have to be innocent we have to be truthful, we have to be honest, we have to be prayerful, we have to be dedicating ourselves not just in the way we speak, 
but in the way we live to God, because that is how that is that people see that people see that um, they see through it eventually when we aren't doing what we need to do in terms of holiness and prayer. And I say this to someone who, hey, I need to do a lot better myself. I need to, you know, I, I talk a big game and it's very easy to talk a big game to a computer screen. It's a harder thing to wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to do, I'm going to say my prayers. I'm going to bring a, I'm going to bring a spirit of peace into my home and not a spirit of conflict and a spirit of anger. Um, I say this as someone who, you know, does not always successful in that regard. Um, and, uh, but I also know and in, in completely convicted that it is essential that we have to we have to be Christians first before we are uh, power players before we are reformers before we are anything else amen I love it professor George I'd love to hear your perspective on that and also your basic like take on social media um because it's always upbeat and I respect you greatly for it well thank you Joe I appreciate that uh, first, I want to say, you know, Brandon McGinley will always be 19 years old to me. <laughs> so I'm sitting here listening and wondering how on earth can there be such wisdom coming out of the mouth of a 19? <laughs> but that's another reason that everyone should get and read uh, Brandon's book. Uh, that wisdom is, uh, is distilled there. Um, I, uh, I'm a natural warrior. I like to fight. And I'm not given to fear, and I like to win. <laughs> but when I was Brandon's age, uh, his real age, uh, one of my great mentors, one of my great rabbis, was Father Richard John Newhouse, a blessed memory. And Richard, seeing in me those features I just described to you, would say to me, Robbie George, he always called me by both my names. He'd say, Robbie George, you think it's your job to win. It's your job to bring home the victory. That's not your job. That's God's job. The victory will come when it comes on his terms and in his time. Your job is to be faithful ever faithful to stand fast and do the right thing you've got to discern what god is calling you to do and then no matter what you've got to stand up and do it don't worry about whether it's successful immediately or even in the medium term your job is to be faithful and to do the right thing it might not be for you to see the victory at all. We, we're all in that position. We're all like Moses. We see the promised land. We've, we've looked at the end of the book. We, we know how this thing ultimately ends, but that doesn't mean necessarily that we're going to get there. But we've got to do our part in all the ways that Brandon mentioned. That beautiful um, triplet uh, Brandon just gave us. Uh, we have to find uh, a, a new way of living a new way of thinking, a new way of being. And that's absolutely right. New in Christ. New means new in Christ, renewed. We bring Christ into our lives, and that's how we provide that light, that little flame uh, in the darkness. Not pretending we're the only little flame. <laughs> you know? We're the only ones here doing the right thing. It's, we're you know, reflecting many, we're, we're reflecting the we're reflecting the, the, the it's really a reflection that's again more wisdom from brandon here that that <laughs> flame is really reflection more than than it is an actual flame it's really a reflection and that's that's what our job is so uh joe on on social media that's one of the things i i try to do that's one of the messages i i, I want to bring uh one of the things joe that's central to my social media presence is the idea of encouraging people and I mean that very literally, to put courage into people who may be despondent, who may be tempted for all the reasons Brandon just articulated to despair. Despair is very appealing these days. Despair also relieves you from responsibility for standing up and fighting and doing the right thing. R R Richard, Father Newhouse didn't, didn't ever deflect me away from fighting. He wants right. me to fight. Uh, and if God made you a fighter, he darn well expects you to be <laughs> fight. 
The problem is don't usurp God's role. Don't think it's up to you. It's not up to you. You're, you're not the general in this battle. <laughs> you're the foot soldier. It's good advice to me. Or how many degrees you have, what prestigious position you have. Uh, you are a foot soldier uh, in, in the army. And the boss is, is, is upstairs. And uh, at the end of the day, he calls the shots. And as I say, the victory comes in his time and, and on his term. But I, 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 I do think, and Joe, this is really, I think, the essence of your question. Uh, I do think we cannot simply marinate in negativity, criticizing the church, criticizing the country, criticizing the public officials, criticizing the world, criticizing the, the left progressives, criticizing everybody. Critique is important, including critique of the institutional church when there's, where there's wrong and there's been much wrong. It's got to be subjected to loving, respectful, but stiff criticism, but we need positive things. We need to be able to say to people, here's what we need to be doing right now. Here's how you become a better reflection of that light. Here's where we need you on the lines of battle. Here's what your contribution can be in the social sphere, in the political sphere, within the church itself. Here's the role you can play. Here's some advice about how you handle the situation when your children are being indoctrinated into ideologies that are hostile to what believers across the board, not just Catholics, but believers across the board know to be true. And I try to provide through the social media presence some of that. Part of that is my own analysis, of course, as you've read, Joe. Part of it is all sorts of interesting things cross my desk uh, by Catholic writers and by others. I mentioned Rabbi uh, Sachs, so many wonderful things that he produced that are great wisdom to, to believers across the, the spectrum. And I just put them out there. I just share them with people in the hope that my fellow academics will read them, uh, the people who are active in the, in the church and various ministries of the church will read them, clergy as well as laity, that ordinary moms and dads will read them, especially when they're relevant to parenting and to bringing up children in the with in the circumstances of cultural challenges uh, we're uh, we're facing, and I think social media can be a powerful, powerful tool that way. So uh, I, I'm I'm not going to sit here and rail against Twitter and Facebook. There's a lot that are wrong with these social media platforms, uh, but let's use them. Let's take advantage of them, at least until they shut us down or shut us out, <laughs> which may be coming soon to a theater near you. <laughs> So, so I, will, far, and, um, I, I have to say, Brandon, I don't know what your experience is. So far, I've been uncensored. For some reason, they'll let me say anything, and I hope that that continues. <laughs> yeah, we know. We yeah, pray yeah. that that continues. <laughs> we pray that that <laughs> yeah, it's all right. The last topic I want to talk about, Brandon, in your book, you talk about the need um, for basic friendships, developing healthy Catholic friendships. I think this is something that we as a church fail at, and what I mean by that is we go to church and then we run out. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's a sad reality yeah. because friendships, you know, we hold each other accountable. And also speaking to friendships, uh, Professor George, I went to see you and Cornell West a while ago at, um, at uh, St. Saint Paul behind the walls in Madison, New Jersey. Yes. You guys, yeah. I was there for that. And I thought it was a great, great um, experience. And I love the friendship that you share with Cornell West because you hold each other accountable. We all need that. We're men in the world. I mean, we're, you know, we have our weaknesses. Friendships are so important. First, Brandon, why, you know, basically illustrate that in the book? Because I think that's something that is missing in the Catholic circles. Um, I want to hear your perspective. Yeah. You know, uh, to a great degree, I, I kind of first came to appreciate this at Princeton with the people who I met there, with the, the culture that is uh, in large part there because of Professor George's influence. Uh, I, I showed up at Princeton not practicing the faith. Um, uh, you know, I was raised Catholic, but I was not practicing the faith. But I met the priests and fellow Catholics there who demonstrated to me, um, and again, this culture is there in large part because of Professor George, that you know, the faith is both that, that unity of faith and reason. For me, it was something that was presented to be in catechesis as being somewhat um, diluted. <laughs> um, and so to, to kind of, to encounter the real thing, both in, 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 um, in the intellectual life and in liturgy and in friendship was essential for, for my own returning to the sacraments. Um, 
And then, you know, that only has been extended since in the friendships that I've been blessed to, to make uh, back home here in Pittsburgh. Um, and it's become just abundantly clear that uh, having people who, um, who are going through the same things that you are, who are, um, who are committed to growing in holiness together is absolutely essential to building the kind of communities that we need if there's going to be anything like a renewal in the church or in the world. Um, these are places where grace is kind of a force magnifier for grace, where the, uh, the grace of the sacraments is communicated among friends um, through acts of hospitality, acts of service, acts of gift um, that, uh, that, that make it Remember, I said we were talking before about how you need to demonstrate that another way of being, another way, another way of living is possible. Well, for me, you know, the friendships that I've been able to share have made it made, for instance, the the the, the, the possibility of being open to a large family has is so much so much less fearful when um, when uh, when you with other people who are doing the same thing and who can help to watch the kids when you have a doctor's appointment or just there's there's both the spiritual aspect of supporting one another in prayer and in an example but also just the material um, you know uh, help that comes with having people around who know your struggles and who are willing to help um, you know I, I think that. While of course, um, you know, you know, of course, you know, I've I've worked in in in, in family pro family policy. Of course, the family is essential, um, but uh, it, it also isn't the st isn't the ending point uh, for what a Catholic uh, community and what a community generally needs to be. There needs to be those kind of sinews among families that give each other strength. Um, and, uh, and so I, you know, while there are so many people out in the world talking about uh, marriage and family, and I've done that myself and continue to do that, I, um, I shift a bit of my focus towards friendship in order to make sure we aren't, um, make sure we make sure we aren't, uh, aren't giving that short shrift either. Professor George, your comments. Yeah, well, more wisdom there from uh, Brandon. I just want to say amen, brother. Um, there are usually downsides and upsides to uh, most good things. Uh, among the things I think that are relevant here is a lot of our churches are large. A lot of Catholic churches are large. They serve inner city or, or, or suburban uh, communities, uh, began often as ethnic communities. Uh, so they're large and, and th that's good, but that's also bad because they're large, they become somewhat impersonal. Number two, we're a sacramental tradition. Thank God, right? Thank God we have the sacraments. That's the essence of our faith. We share that with our Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters. Uh, but the downside is people are tempted to think, well, we come to church to get the sacrament. That's the point. We have to take Holy Communion and then we leave. Some people don't even stay for the blessing, right? They take Holy Communion and leave. But the idea that you'd stay after church for coffee, you'd get to know people, that there was something important about the fellowship of believers there uh, is, is less common among us Catholics than it is among, say, our evangelical. Uh, brothers and, uh, and sisters. And there we have something to learn from them, just as we have something to learn with them about the importance of the Bible and the role of the Bible in our own spiritual lives. So we have something to learn just from the fellowship of evangelical communities. They put a lot more emphasis on that than we do. And there's no reason we shouldn't. It's completely consistent with everything we believe. So stay for the blessing, but don't just stay for the blessing. Right. You know, don't just take communion and leave, stay for the blessing, and then get to know your fellow par parishioners. We really fall down on that as, uh, as, as Catholics. The other thing is, is we speak rightly, because it's true, of uh, the Sunday obligation. So for many Catholics, we're there because it's an obligation. <laughs> now, nobody's holding a gun to our head. It's a free country. <laughs> In a certain sense, it's voluntary. But if we think it as an, of it as an obligation to fulfill, if that's the main way of looking at it, then we're going to be off track. And again, it will deflect us away from the fellowship part of the whole thing. We're there, we get it done, we fulfill our obligation, we go home, there are other things to do. Maybe family things, which are great, right? Sunday family dinner, I love that growing up. Sunday family lunch, we call it a dinner, but it was actually lunch after mass. You know, that's, that's a wonderful thing to do. But we need that fellowship. We need that fellowship. And that's something that on a parish by parish by parish basis, I would like to see us build in the Catholic community across the whole world, but certainly here uh, in the United States. 
And as Brandon says, friendship is just terribly, terribly important. We generally as a culture, if I can engage here in a little bit of cultural criticism, cultural critique, as a culture, our problem is we tend to instrumentalize everything. Everything is a means to some other end. We always want to know what did you get out of it or what can I get out of it? And that causes us sometimes to reduce things that are ends in themselves properly understood because they're intrinsic aspects of our well being and fulfillment, intrinsic perfections and enrichments of the human being. We reduce them to mere instrumentalities, to means. And that's a mistake. And we do it even with marital relationships, and we do it with friendships, and we do it with familial relationships. We instrumentalize our friendships, and we mustn't do that. The, the joy of friendship, the beautiful friendship I have with my dear brother Cornell West, and we do hold each other accountable, and we do revel in each other's humanity, and we do enjoy the arguments we have on the many points on which we disagree, and we enjoy the work we do together witnessing on the points where we do uh, agree. But but and we have a mission. We, as as a pair of friends, uh, we we really feel we have a mission. There, there there's there's a message we're trying to bring to the whole country. But our friendship is not reducible to that mission. Yeah. More fundamental is the friendship itself. We want that friendship to be fruitful. That's the mission. But that's not the reason for the friendship. The friendship is the reason for the friendship. We need to get out of this mode of looking at everything instrumentally. We look at church instrumentally, you know? Uh, we, we, we even look at education purely instrumentally. That's something we have to get away from too. When we try to make sure our, our, our young men and women, our children get a good education, it shouldn't just be oriented toward instrumental goals. Good job, making a lot of money, prestige, status, and so forth. Again, those are valuable goals. They're worthwhile. They're not bad in themselves, but they're not what's fundamental. The reason you want your children to be educated is so that their lives will be enriched by the intrinsic value of learning, of knowledge, especially about the highest and most important things, knowledge of God. And we mustn't just instrumentalize that. It's for the intrinsic enrichment of knowledge of God that we want our young men and women and we want ourselves to know as much about God and his work and his plan for us as possible. End of sermon. <laughs> We and love it. It's fantastic. Um, guys, this was a fantastic conversation. Um, I guess I'd like to hopefully encourage all people who listen to this to have confidence in yourself. I think a lot of people recognize the truth. They just don't feel confident enough many times. And this is what I think this does, this conversation. People, all people have something to offer. We're all different in this conversation and we all have different worlds, but we all have something to offer. And that's my hope that this forum, basically the fruit that it bears. People need to have confidence because sadly, um, the way that the culture is basically going, the direction, the politic, if you disagree, they're really pushing you into the corner. And I think if, if people have confidence, um, I think we'd have a better, better country. And I think the culture would be starting to uh, go towards uh, the light, so to speak. And sadly, um, it's needed. I think one thing that I got from uh, you know, the last few minutes is, that, is to encourage, as you said, Professor George, um, and Brandon mentioned it also, to be involved, and Brandon and I were talking about it before uh, before we started recording, is that to be involved in your parish, to get involved, to make those relate, form those relationships with other people. Because again, if we're feeling somewhat isolated, okay, by this by this culture, then shouldn't wouldn't it behoove us to establish and strengthen relationships within the church? By like you said, Professor George. Don't leave to go watch a Jet game. Not that there's much to watch with the Jets this year, but don't leave to go watch a Jet game at one o'clock. Go have coffee downstairs. Go meet your fellow parishioners. Go, as you use the word, encourage one another that we're not alone. Of course, we have God, but we need to let each other know that, that we're all in the same fight and we're all there for each other. We should, we should really try to encourage that more amongst Catholics. We can evangelize the world. How about we start building our communities within those parishes, as you said? I think it's very, very important. Show the book. Oh, yeah. Let's let's plug the book. 
There's a <laughs> prodigal church. Brandon, where can people find the book? You can find it uh, anywhere Catholic books are sold and at sophiainstitute.com slash prodigal church. Excellent. And Professor George, your book's been out for a while, but <laughs> if anybody wants to listen to Joe Racinello and go out and buy Clash of Orthodoxies, <laughs> where uh, where can they, I'm sure it's available on, on major outlets. All, all the all the major booksellers. My more recent book is called Conscience and Its Enemies, uh, also available from all the major booksellers. Awesome. Awesome. So we want to thank you both very, very much uh, from not just Joe and I, but all our viewers at the front line with Joe and Joe, Brandon McGinley, Professor Robert George. Hopefully we can have you guys back on soon, uh, you know, and uh, we'll find another conversation, another book or another topic to talk about. <laughs> but we really, really appreciate it. This is a very, uh, a very important conversation. We think our, our, our viewers are absolutely going to like it. And, and more importantly, hopefully they share it with others. So we thank you very, very much. And that, honestly, for your time. I know you're both busy people. I sincerely thank you both. And most importantly, I think our listeners will thank you. I think there's a lot to be basically vetted from this conversation. Thank you. Well, God right, bless well. you both. Uh, and uh, Brandon, so proud of you. Love to Thanks, Katie. It's wonderful to see you. All right. Thank you again, everyone, for watching The Frontline with Joe and Joe, Joe Pasillo and Joe Resinello. And remember, until next time, that our conversation is your conversation. And that conversation is going on everywhere. We'll see you next time.